I do some consulting work on the American feeling Indian in the room issues. Was you don't ever say to her that her point about the Chicago incident. 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 She's qualified for services. We laugh. She's more of a community. We're trying to back over. doing an autism. Margaret Atwood is considered to be one of the most important and influential writers alive today. The Canadian author has more than 40 books to her credit, including poetry, short stories, children's fiction, and 14 novels. She has earned worldwide accolades for her work, which has been translated into more than 40 languages. The Handmaid's Tale and The Blind Assassin, two of her best-known works, won the Booker Prize. We'll talk with her about life as a writer, the difference between speculative fiction and science science fiction, and about the manuscript she's writing for the Future Library Project. Readers won't see the book for 100 years. Here's our conversation with Margaret Atwood. Margaret Atwood, welcome to the program. Thank you. You're here at Penn State to receive the Institute of Arts and Humanities Medal for Distinguished Achievement, something that's been given annually since 2006. So congratulations. We are delighted Thank to have you. you at Penn State. Your career spans 50 years, and uh, you have received numerous national and international awards. With that, I'm sure uh, the money has been piling up with the awards, and I, I, I think it's safe to say that it's not those two things that keep you at this art and at such an amazing pace 50 years later. What, what is it that, that keeps you at it? Well, I think uh, Samuel Beckett put it very well. When somebody asked him that, he said, not good for anything else. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, Is you are... a good answer? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> as good as any. And Mavis Gallant said, uh, you, you, you think when you start uh, that you're in control of the camel. <laughs> but then once you're way out into the desert, you realize the camel is in control of you. Well, you started at 16. You made a I commitment did. to become a professional writer at 16, which I look at as a gift in a way that you knew this is where you were headed. Yes, it was also very ignorant because I, I didn't realize what was involved. I didn't have any role models available to me in that place at that time in the middle of the, of the 50s in, in Canada. In the wilderness in Canada. Well, I wasn't in the wilderness when At I was 16. I was in high school. which <laughs> Some people think of that as the wilderness, <laughs> but uh, I was in high school, and, and uh, I just didn't really know uh, what it would involve. I, I knew that I would have to have another means of support. I, I didn't expect to s somehow burst into bestsellerdom right away. So I, I had some practicality. My parents, of course, didn't weren't in favor of this plan at all. They wanted me to be a, a scientist. Which they were. Your mother was a nutritionist, your father was an entomologist, That's and your right. brothers were, were scientists. Well, uh, there's only one of them, but he would be pleased to be plural. <laughs> well, I, pardon me for that. You know, you're part of the so-called silent generation. That was born between 1925 and 1945. Why were we silent? Well, that's a good question. Yeah. Time, that magazine, silent, really? Time, Time magazine. Time magazine says that the children born in, in that time period were unimaginative, withdrawn, unadventurous, and cautious, which to me is the antithesis of what you are. Not the ones I knew. <laughs> uh, I don't know what they were counting or where, where they were counting them. Uh, so I, I really don't know where they, they got that idea. I, I think that. Uh, for instance, people in the Depression had to be very inventive because they had to figure out how to get through it. And then people in the war years had to be similarly inventive. Uh, and the people who went to the war and then came back were usually hellraisers. We, we were told when we were in college that we weren't as nearly as interesting as the vets who had come back and, because they had come back. They were, they were grown up and they questioned everything. and. Uh, didn't necessarily believe what was told to them and uh, were funny and irreverent and and we were a bit more subdued than that but not my particular bunch of people your, your the, particular cohort the particular cohorts were the we were the handful interested in the arts so we essentially were inventing things from the ground up because there wasn't a scene in uh, 
Toronto at that time a kind of visible artistic thing that you could be part of. There wasn't a, a Greenwich Village type of thing. Do you think that part of your vivid imagination stems from the fact that you did grow up in the wilderness in Quebec, isolated really from uh, a lot of other people? You, you describe it as six people, six houses in a little settlement without no, running water. I wasn't water. in the settlement. I, I could see the settlement way down the lake. But we were in the woods. We weren't even even in a more village. isolated. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. I, of course, I, children think of anything that happens to them as as normal life. So uh, you don't think of yourself as isolated, and I, I certainly didn't. That was just how we lived. So on the other hand, it meant that I wasn't I wasn't properly socialized. Uh, other little girls complain of having had to wear pink frilly dresses. I, w I longed for a pink frilly dress. <laughs> I just didn't get one. I got I got overalls. <laughs> you said though, when you were a child, if your mother wanted to eat, she'd go catch a fish. Yes. So no, you she, had this she very wanted independent... to feed people for dinner. Uh, if she wanted to eat, then it was the it would probably be the. I mean, you have to picture no grocery store, right? Uh, so they had a, a kitchen garden, and they had a lot of things in tins, and they had. Uh, some very well cured bacon, those were the kinds of things. Spam is actually quite good if you cook it over a wood stove. You're giving me that disbelieving <laughs> look. <laughs> I've never, I, I must say, I've never tried spam. <laughs> well, I tried under the right circumstances. We also had something called klim. Uh, people of a certain generation will remember klim. It's, it's milk spelled backwards, and it was powdered whole milk. We used to buy it in sort of vats like that, and you beat it up with an egg beater. And there were always lumps, and I, I liked the lumps best. <laughs> so these are childhood memories that not everyone will share. I want to talk a little bit about uh, what is uh, arguably your best known work, and that is The Handmaid's Tale, uh, which came out in 1985. Many saw it as a movie when it came out in 1990, starring Natasha Richardson. That book, that work, still can uh, elicit strong reactions to this day. What, what, what do you suppose is behind uh, the, the reactions that it still generates? Well, when I published it in 1985-6, um, 85 I think in Canada and I think it was 86 in the U.S. and the U.K., uh, it had three different reactions. So in the UK, who had already had their religious civil war and weren't about to have another one, said, jolly good yarn. <laughs> in Canada, a perennially anxious country, they said, could it happen here? And in the US, they said, how long have we got? So even then, in 1985, people were feeling uh, quite alarmed about some of the things in the book. Uh, and they also were saying things like, well, you know, are you, is this about the Middle East? I would say, actually, no, it's about everybody. I took examples from all around the world. And all you have to do is go back in our history, maybe 100 years, and you're going to find very similar things. You look at Boko Haram today in Nigeria, they're kidnapping girls and saying, you will not be educated. And oh, of I know. course, the very handmaids. Much so. yeah, yeah, but w education for women was hotly debated in the 19th century uh, in England. So this is not very long ago. Uh, it's, these are things that have happened over history, and there is no rule that says that things have to keep getting better. Sometimes they go backwards, they get worse. So. That for that reason, and also because you often hear sentiments expressed in this country and in my country uh, that are very similar to some of the things that people say in the book. That was less true in the mid-80s than it is now. In the mid-80s, some people, such as Mary McCarthy, basically said it could never happen here. But I just, I don't believe... Mary McCarthy in the New York Times. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I never believe it could never happen here because if you look at history, pivotal moments, it, whatever it may have been, happened. 
um, to people who thought it would never happen here. Well, you mentioned Mary McCarthy of the New York Times. Uh, Time magazine named The Handmaid's Tale the book of 2000. Did they? They did, and in fact, they named it one of the 100 best uh, English language novels after 1923. And I contrasted that with the review that Mary McCarthy wrote, uh, and I was sort of astounded at her reaction to it. Um, you've been described... Well, she was a kind of old socialist in a way, and uh, people of that generation in, in that group really wanted to believe that things would get better all the time and that... Um, she thought you were too negative. Yeah, I think so. And, and also, I don't, think she, I don't think she understood religion. Uh, she ought to. She went to a Catholic girls' school. But I, I think she thought she had gotten out of that and that, that we were, you know, putting that behind us. But uh, that's never true. Well, speaking of religion, religion is a part of so many of your books. Uh, and you have read and reread the Bible. So I'm kind of curious to know what your beliefs are and what you get. My guess is you get lots of fodder for your stories from the Bible. Well, there are three big wellsprings of motifs in Western literature. Uh, Greek and Roman literature and mythology is one of them. Um, folk tale, you know, Grimm's fairy tale. We all know who Cinderella is. Uh, in fact, Cinderella happens to be the oldest story that we know about in the world. And mm. those glass slippers used to be fur. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> it is. Uh, so, so folk tale, Greek and Roman mythology, and the Bible. And if you went through Honors English, which was from Anglo-Saxon to T.S. Eliot, in the early, late, late 50s, early 60s, where I went to um, university, you had to know the Bible. Uh, I knew it anyway because it being Canada, we had it in school. We didn't have the separation of church and state. We had two school systems, one Catholic, one Protestant, and the one I went through was the Protestant school system, and we had it every day, and we also had it for memory work. Uh, we memorized poems in those days, so, so of course I know it. and. Uh, of course, I know the references in Western literature that that come out of it and relate to it, including a number of William Faulkner's novel titles, etc., etc., etc. So that that's just part of a literary education. But that was one question, um, and pe people are complaining to me today. You know, we're teaching these kids, and they they don't know the Bible stories. They don't even know about Noah. They don't even know about. Yeah, and then the if they see it on the big screen, stuff, it's such a distorted know. view of, of what. Uh, well, it's a very interesting view, but people have reinterpreted those stories in every generation, so it's not unusual uh, to have a story reinterpreted. It's happened uh, regularly. Well, I guess I'm wondering because the state of North Carolina has actually taken The Handmaid's Tale off the required reading list. Oh, people have done that all over the place. Saying that it's anti-religion and it's anti-Bible. Well, they haven't read it very carefully, have they? They, they? they missed the Lord's Prayer spoken by the uh, central character, didn't they? They did. Yeah, slightly differently worded, but okay, let's talk about this because it's important. Uh, religion can be a positive faith that helps and encourages people and comforts them in time of trouble, or it can be a hammer to hit people over the head with, uh, used Just by the way those it's often who, used. Often used by those who want more power for themselves. So those are those those two things have pretty much always been true, and it's probably also true that uh, the impulse to religion, or let us say, the impulse to believe in an invisible power greater than yourself. Um, that is probably an evolved adaptation, and people are going to do it whether you want them to or not. That invisible thing bigger than themselves may be the stock market. I think a lot of people believe in that. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> or it may be, quotes, science, that big thing that's invisible, that's bigger than yourself. There are all sorts of things that people believe in that need not necessarily be an established religion but they all do it in one way or another. Well, speaking of science, and you may be bored with this question, uh, but you make a distinction between uh, 
science fiction and speculative science. What you write, you say, is speculative fiction, rather. You just well, jumped the tracks big time. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what, yeah, what, what let's distinguishes... Let's get back to what, what I actually believe. I'm a, I'm a hardcore agnostic. Okay. And what does that mean? It means you shouldn't proclaim as knowledge something that is actually faith. And that's a pretty simple distinction. So let's, let's just say some things are matters of faith and other things are matters of knowledge. You can prove them. So you shouldn't confuse the one with the other. Okay, so let's move. I'm, yeah. I'm, glad, I'm glad you answered. Speculative you had. fiction, science fiction. The French don't have a problem with this question. And the reason that they don't have a problem with this question is that they have always had a term for what we uh, call speculative fiction, and it's roman d'anticipation, a novel of anticipation. And they consider that distinct from, different from, science fiction proper, uh, what with spaceships, aliens, um, things taking over your body, and you know other, other memes of the genre. So they don't have a problem. Nobody ever asked me this question <laughs> there. Uh, they have a bit of a problem here, I think due to the bookstore habit of, of uh, putting everything on a shelf labeled science fiction, if it is in any way about the, the future or if it is in any way uh, got things in it like robots and stuff. Though the more we go on, the more robots we actually have in real life. You know, anyone who reads your stories will say that that uh, Margaret Atwood must be prescient because you have written about things that have happened. Uh, you know, and and I just read two weeks ago about robots that, as they've evolved from generation to generation, they've learned to lie to one another. And I think, wow, that that could be part of one of your next stories. It's pretty interesting. Uh, yes, it's pretty interesting. Artificial intelligence is a very interesting subject. Um, but my books don't, for instance, have other planets, spaceships, aliens, or any of those things. So if, you, if it's got science fiction on the front, and you open it up and there aren't any of those things in it, and you wanted there to be, wouldn't You're you disappointed. Be an, wouldn't you be annoyed? <laughs> I, would be, I, want, I, want, I want the label to say what the kind of thing you might expect to have in it. So if it's fantasy, I do expect the occasional magician or dragon. I mean, it would be very paltry not to put those in. Do you expect one day for there to be a speculative fiction book or, or shelf in a bookstore? Yes, I would think so. Um, but on the other hand, bookstores, of course, wanting to sell lots of books, they might prefer just to have them all on the one shelf and then somebody might, by mistake, <laughs> pick up something they might not otherwise. Um, but people were, were pretty clear about that when they, were, when they were writing, when they started writing this kind of thing. Jules Verne has started with what we would now call speculative fiction. Um, considered that he was writing about things that might really happen. And could happen. Is, could, it, could, it, and is he the... expected them to. He was writing about submarines and air travel and things that he fully expected would happen, and guess what? They did. Maybe not quite the way he pictured it, but they happened. Yeah, you, you've written about meat being grown in Petri dishes and pagoons, uh, and, and uh, organs that things, come yeah. from pigs and are transplanted it's... to humans, things that, that now are headlines in, in newspapers. I know, but I knew, all that I knew back when I started that people were working on those things. They just hadn't succeeded yet. Uh, one of the latest is they've put some human cortex tissue into mice. That's all we needed. Mm, oh my Smarter goodness. mice, <laughs> thanks. Don't let them out. <laughs> there was a group from uh, National Security who got together with filmmakers and writers. It was after 9-11. Yes, yeah, and sure. said, um, you know, what sorts of things might be coming down the pike? Where are our vulnerabilities? Yeah, exactly. Had you been asked by National Security to be part of that conversation, would you have contributed? Well, one of the things I would have said is, is the 9-11 episode came right out of Star Wars, where they fly the plane into the Death Star and blow it up. Uh, they An happened. episode I didn't see. It was in the first one. Okay. Not Star Trek, Star Wars, the oh, movie. Oh, okay. Yeah, Han Solo flies, uh, the, and, and his pal uh, fly this decrepit 
plane into the Death Star. They, they happened to be able to throw the explosive device and then go screaming out so they, so they don't die. Uh, but the idea of using a plane as a weapon, it's right in that movie. Mm. You said earlier that when you were coming up as a young writer that you didn't have role models, that there wasn't a, a, a really big literary scene in Canada. And That's so, putting it mildly. <laughs> Has it changed much? It's com changed completely. Yes, it was absolutely completely, but that was a long time ago. We're now thinking of in 1960, for instance, there were five uh, novels published in English Canada by English Canadian publishers, and it was the same in Quebec, uh, a very small number. And a lot of books were imported. Uh, so it was very, very small. And uh, In fact, you were featured. Uh, your partner, Graham Gibson, wrote a book, 11 Canadian Novelists, and, and you were number one. That was 10 years one. later, because I began with A. They're alphabetically arranged. Um, I edited that book. It was very funny. We were using reel-to-reel -reel tape in those days, and we had a typist who transcribed it for us, and we realized afterwards that she was, she was a little bit deaf. So there were a lot of... Words missing? Well, and words that had been tra transformed into other words. So I more or less had to guess what people were saying. <laughs> anyway, it was lots of fun. But between 60 and 70, we, uh, our generation was, in, was inventing publishing companies. So that book came out of that whole movement. I don't know where they got the silent generation. These people were very noisy Anything as but far silent. as I could tell. <laughs> You have said that every Canadian has a complicated relationship with the United States. What do you mean by that? And can you speak for yourself what, what that means as well? I am the spy amongst you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I go here and there. Uh, okay, so think of a map. There's a map. On your map, there's a sort of a line across, and there's nothing above it, but, but actually it's, it's us. We're above that line. And so therefore, south of us, we've got you. And south of you, you've got Mexico. That's very different right there. Uh, you are uh, smaller in size, but you have a lot more people. What's the population now of the US? 300 uh, million. Probably about like okay, that. OK, 300 million. Yeah. Okay, so, I was coming to so that. So 10 times bigger when you're talking about economies of scale and who can sell what to whom and who can make it cheaper and all those kinds of things, you can see it would have an impact. Uh, In so fact, we, you talk about Canada as not occupied but dominated. Is that well, how Canadians feel? I think they feel, they're, they're very aware that there's an extremely large market to the south of them. And that can have good effects and it can have bad effects. The good effects are, if they can think of something to sell to that very large market, that's a good effect. But on the other hand, if that very large market decides to sell things to them uh, that they want to sell to themselves, that can be a bad effect. Uh, the other thing is it is a one-way mirror. We know all about your culture. We and we don't everything. know enough about yours. You know very little about ours. Yes, it's and true. And that's an insult, isn't it? No, I don't think so. It, it, it means that we can lie to you with impunity. <laughs> but there's a guy called Rick Mercer who has a uh, show, a television show, and he came I down. I saw a video you, know, you did for him. <laughs> yeah, you know, I did a video for him, but, I, but he also did another show in, went, in which he went around and asked these really quite impossible questions to Americans about Canada. And it was and, embarrassing. Uh, well, it was... For us, I'm sure. It was funny. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure that the Canadians would have done any... Better? They would have done a bit better. Uh, on questions about you, but but maybe not a hundred percent. You know, there's an astonishing amount that people don't know either about themselves or or about other people. Well, there's a wonderful video about you giving some uh, uh, some ice hockey lessons, and I'll let people look that up. But I want to quickly move to to something that you uh, are working on or have done, which I think is absolutely fascinating: the Future Library Project. You were the first author to submit a manuscript. I haven't done it yet. You haven't, that's okay. That's happening in June. Okay. Okay. So To be uh, unveiled 100 years from now. That's right. So it, it is a Sleeping Beauty project. Uh, there's a forest in Norway that will grow for 100 years. And each one of those 100 years, a different author will be asked to submit a manuscript to the future library. 
and all they're allowed to tell about it is, the, is their name and the title, nothing else. So it'll be in a sealed box, it'll be put into this library in Norway, and uh, it and can be a poem, it can be a story, it can be a novel, it can be nonfiction, no images, and you can't tell anybody what's in it. So year 100, enough trees will be cut down to make the paper to print those 100 books. And who knows if we'll have printers 100 it's years a vote from now. of optimism. She's putting a printing press in the room, just in case. Katie Patterson is the name of the conceptual artist who thought it up. And uh, therefore, my book will be 100 years old, and the final book will only be one year old. The people choosing, say, the, at the 50-year mark, uh, that committee hasn't been born yet. And the final committee, uh, we have no idea who those people will be, what their literary tastes will be, but it is a vote of confidence in the future. There in will be people, there will be books, people will be able to read. Isn't that cheerful? <laughs> it is, and on that note, we're out of time. Thank you, Margaret Atwood, so much for talking with us. And thank you. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Margaret Atwood. Comcast subscribers can watch this program anytime on Penn State On Demand. Find out how through our website, conversations.psu.edu, where you'll also find excerpts from Atwood's books. I'm Patty Satalia. We hope you'll join us for our next conversation from Penn State. Production funding provided in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Thank you. This has been a production of WPSU.